minimum sentencing. Uh, the, the amendment that you have in front of you now would ensure that Senate Bill 4 does not subvert our court's fundamental duty to serve the interests of justice by requiring judges to impose unwarranted mandatory minimum penalties with no regard for even the most exceptional extenuating circumstances. You've heard it said in this debate, well, if that's the case, then I'm sure someone will figure it out. The prosecutor won't charge it or this other situation won't occur. I'm Amen. sure it'll all get worked out. Well, as someone who's worked in the court systems, uh, when everyone else turns a blind eye, I guarantee you it doesn't get sorted out. That's why this bill needs this amendment, because it ensures that the neutral arbiters, the judges, are able to look at the, any extenuating circumstances in a case. They would prevent judges from being forced to impose sentences that are disproportionate to the crime at hand. Crimes that when punished with the mandatory minimum would result in unconscionable harm to the offender and unjustifiable cost to the state when mitigating factors make it obvious that a 10-year prison sentence is improper and unethical. As a former federal judge, Paul Castle, a George W. Bush appointee who chaired the Criminal Law Committee of the Judicial Conference of the United States stated, mandatory minimum sentences mean one size fits all injustice that require judges to put blinders on the unique facts and circumstances to that particular case. That being said, this amendment would not, however, give judges total discretion to ignore the will of the legislature if SB4 is actually enacted. What it would allow them to do would be to impose a sentence below the minimum only after considering the nature and circumstances of the crime and the history and character of the defendant and making written findings for the record that the reduced penalty would maintain public safety and would not depreciate the seriousness of any offense. As you've heard said, we want to take these offenses Degree seriously. Of so with this or affinity, and it would you allow judges shift. to have this discretion to make a deviation downward, which is something that multiple states have done, both Republican and Democrat, because as I said before, the disastrous policy of mandatory minimum sentencing has been rejected up and down the political aisle, including in 2018 under the Trump administration. Degree. These are the types of policies that if we blindly enact them, they will lead to grave injustices across the system. This amendment does no violence to the underlying purpose of this statute. Because if the facts warrant it and the minimum sentence is what needs to be imposed, I trust those judges are going to impose it. And if there is that case that we've described here of that kid who picked up a couple hundred bucks to take a person from one place to the next, and the judge gets to look at their history and gets to understand the facts and circumstances of that case, and they're not the big bad smuggler that you all think you're going after, the judge can say, I'm going to make written findings on the record, those judges who are accountable to the voters in their community, and they're going to make that determination and deviate downward when appropriate. But in every other instance, the mandatory minimum will be instituted. This is a very narrowly crafted way to ensure that justice in those very unique circumstances is not subverted by a mandatory minimum sentence. Ms. Johnson, for what purpose? Will the gentleman yield for questions? The gentleman yield for questions. Of course. The gentleman yields. Mr. Chairman, I just realized uh, part of the reason, again, Representative Flores had offered that amendment of with intent to obtain a pecuniary benefit is because we'd recently, again, made changes to Ms. the smuggling statute and taken out that important element. And so, again, what we know with the expansion of this existing statute is not only will we potentially catch up family members, but we may just catch up kids mules. We just saw Representative Garcia's attempt to recognize children in their level. So what will the impact and the burden be on the finances and the budget of the state of Texas to increase this mandatory minimum for potential very low level offenders within the chain of this organized crime? If well, it is. I, look, I don't have exact numbers, but I don't need them to tell you yep. when you take this authority away from judge and jury, to decide that, yes, there's some culpability here,
but the culpability raises to probation. The culpability rises to the level of some, some time behind prison bars. But when you expand that to say, must be 10 year minimum, the costs are going to go up and up and up. And if the costs go up and we don't live in flush times to make more beds, then effectively people get let out on parole earlier and earlier and it actually diminishes the deterrent impact of the crime because it doesn't get taken seriously at all, correct? Yes, that is exactly correct. And you are reciting history. This is not Ann Johnson telling people that maybe something might happen if we do this. This is the history of what happens with mandatory minimum sentences. It is why both Republicans and Democrats have wholeheartedly rejected expanding them and in fact tried to figure out ways to curtail them because what happens is you have an overburdened population in the prison system and then you have a revolving door and whatever big bad deterrent effect you thought you had is now gone because these people are just gonna revolve in and out. The mandatory minimum will mean nothing because you have jammed it full of everybody no matter what the facts and circumstances of their case was. Individualized sentencing is always the best and smartest way to do things. That means you can take the people that you feel are dangerous and you're scared of and make sure they are punished appropriately and kept out of society in that way. And those people who have made mistakes, criminal mistakes, are held accountable, but in a different way that fits for them. You and I, when we were prosecutors, took oaths to see that justice is done. There's no definition of what that is. That means every single case, justice can be different. It can be a dismissal. It can be some type of pretrial diversion. It can be probation. It could be prison. It could be the death penalty. It runs the gamut. But when you hamstring people and you go, justice just looks like this in this case, you're doing, you're doing, you're doing a grave disservice to the system as a whole and to everybody that interacts with it. Let's also talk about, you and I have probably experienced this as prosecutors, which is sometimes the legislature can help a little too much. Because when you set the floor too high, there are times when the jury knows what the floor will be. And when you're in jury selection, I can't even get through the fact that regular folks can't anticipate why that minimum would come up. And oftentimes, it keeps me from getting a jury that would be a good jury in evaluating the facts to determine a full range of punishment. Oh, Tell them about that. Qualifying a jury on punishment is gonna become a lot more difficult. And when that happens, guess what? Nothing. You don't get any justice in these situations because you can't impanel a jury, you can't try the case, or you've gotta try it multiple times, which means more resources, more time in an overburdened system. So we cannot, we do this time and again, and I won't belabor the point because I get it, I understand it, but we do this time and again. We say something's a problem, we say it's a crisis, and we go, well, let's just jam it over here in the criminal justice system. Oh, it's not harsh enough, I will do a mandatory, I don't don't need to know the facts. It's too complicated, I don't want to dive into it, I don't want to understand the complexities of the environments that some of these situations are happening in, so I will make these simple uneducated decision to just say this is a one-size-fits-all approach and I'll walk out of this building and I won't care about what this does in our communities in the way it impacts our jail and prison systems because that works a disservice to all of us. If those systems aren't working in an efficient manner in a way that works and moving people out that need to be out and keeping people in that need to stay in, that's a safety risk for all of us. Mandatory minimums are being rejected across this country up to and including the Trump administration in 2018, who expanded, who actually expanded language very similar to this. Eligibility for a judicial safety valve, that's what this is called. This is not a concept I came up with, I wish I could claim it, but this is something that exists in law elsewhere because it's smart. It allows the toughness that everybody thinks they wanna have, but it also allows people to understand the individual facts and circumstances in any case, because every person that walks through that door has a different story that brought them into that door. And if you don't reflect that in your sentencing, you are doing a grave disservice to your community. So Chairman Moody, I know you and I are both Democrats, but we've also had- Some people think I am. (laughs) We've also had the experience of actually being law and order 
prosecuting, holding people to account, and actually walking this walk of acknowledging that there are reasons to have criminal laws and that we enforce them. And you and I both probably sat in those CLEs after the session where district attorneys across the state will shake their head and say, boy, I wish you guys would stop trying to help me. And so while it may seem like we're trying to tell them something that is some partisan thing, we're actually trying to speak up for prosecutors across the state to say, hey, you may take this to a point that has the counter effect of what you say you want. And so maybe take, give us a vote on this amendment. Gentlemen's time has expired. Move adoption. The chair recognizes Mr. Guillen in opposition to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, the intent of the bill, again, is to increase the penalty for smuggling, uh, to have the severity of the sentence deter this type of criminal activity. This amendment would give judges the discretion to override the legislative intent of this bill, and thereby this proposed amendment defeats the purpose of the bill. It, it guts the bill, and so uh, please stay with me in opposing the amendment and vote no on the amendment. Mr. Moody, for what purpose? Mr. Speaker, will the gentleman yield for some questions? Oh, gentleman yield for questions. Yes. Gentleman yields. I guess my question would be if this becomes part of law, which it is in, state, in other states and the federal side, that gives this discretion. That, that, that in no way subverts the intent of the legislature, because I'm asking us to give them that discretion. Right, right. It, it, the intent of the bill. Okay. The, the intent of the bill is to, my understanding, create, you've got, you've got some enhanced penalties and stacking and some other provisions with stash houses and with smuggling. And so you've had a lot of discourse on this front and back mic about different cases that may present themselves with different fact scenarios. And do you agree that maybe justice looks different for someone like that kid I described before, as opposed to someone who is nefariously uh, going out and smuggling people intentionally? Do you, do you not think those are different scenarios? Obviously different scenarios. So don't different scenarios deserve different treatment? or different consideration? In general, yes. But in this bill, without this amendment, we're going to treat them all the same, correct? Correct. Are you aware of what happened in the 80s and 90s when mandatory minimum sentences became the norm across the country under Democrat and Republican administrations? In fact, this state was not uh, not immune from doing that at the time under democratic control. Are you aware that, uh, of the results of that experiment? Vaguely. Mr. Ginn, what I ask you to think about is the net effect of this. If the goal is to make sure that we are hammering the folks that deserve it and using our resources wisely, then a safety valve in very narrow circumstances like this would allow us and our judges to at least take that into consideration. It does, does, does this amendment in any way remove the mandatory minimum? I believe it does, yes. You th is, can you point me to the portion of the amendment that removes the mandatory minimum? Well, by giving the, uh, the judges the discretion, it would remove the mandatory minimum. Does it, does it make them? Well, it gives them the discretion. So a court, a court can impose if they make findings on the record. It gives, them, it gives the judges the discretion to choose. You represent a whole lot of counties, right? You got a whole lot of judges, I'm sure, that you deal with uh, across that district. Is there any reason why you wouldn't want to entrust those judges who have the particularized knowledge of, a, of that case in front of them to say the mandatory minimum is the right fit for this case or not? In this case, we're setting the mandatory minimum to deter this crime. We're making a statement, uh, we're putting our, our foot down and saying, hey, 
we're going to put a mandatory minimum, we're serious, we're going to throw the book at them to deter this kind of crime. No, and, and what I'm telling you is that under these statutes, you would agree with me, as it's been discussed in, these, in, in, this, in this dialogue, in this debate on this bill, there are a number of potential scenarios that fit under smuggling, and they vary in degree of severity, do they not? I, I guess I could agree with that. Would you agree with me, though, that when, even when faced with a varying set of scenarios, if a judge is given a mandatory minimum, they do not have a choice to consider any mitigating factors? I agree. That's what we're doing in the bill. Do, so is your position that the right public policy it would be to ignore mitigating factors and individualized facts in a case? In this case, yes. All right. Thank you. The chair recognizes Mr. Sure. The chair recognizes Mr. Romero in favor of the amendment. Members, I, I'm pretty sure that when the author drafted this bill, he's real careful to make sure that he sends that loud and, cloud, loud and clear signal to anyone in this industry, if you want to call it an industry, and that's moving humans across our borders and into our state that they want to throw the book at them. And I think if you were listening, and I'm not sure that many of you were, to the discourse between the front mic and the back mic, but you should have, especially when you have prosecutors up here that are telling you the judges make the right decisions. And this, without this amendment, you're taking it away completely. So I imagine your decisions are made, but I don't think you're putting a face on who these criminals are. They're the smartest of our kids. Do you think these criminals are not targeting the smartest kids to drive those people? They are. And if you think, well, it's easy to throw the book at them because they should just know better, you don't realize what, how it works. Many of these kids first, they've been Drugs have been pushed onto them. They've made them users. Many of these kids might be some of those people that have been caught up in sex trafficking. Many of them might even be U.S. citizen kids, boys and girls like Representative Garcia talked about, that are 18 years old, that might still have parents on the other side of the border. And their parents might be held. Their nephews might be held being threatened to kill them. And you're not even listening because you don't care about that kid because you don't see his face. Well, that face of that son or that daughter could be your own son or your own daughter. And I think that when we all agreed that we swore that oath to do the best for all of our citizens of Texas, you really should be thinking about those kids and you should be listening to Representative Moody in this amendment. This amendment makes sense. You can continue to vote them all down, but if there's one you're going to vote for, this is it. Because this is going to save lives. Without it, you're absolutely ruining lives. And it's not just some little Mexican kid. These are Americans. Because that's who those traffickers target. The smart kids. The kids that otherwise are doing well, but maybe you're having a little trouble at home and have found themselves homeless. Vote in favor of this amendment. You can save some lives. The chair recognizes Mr. Moody to close on the amendment. Well, let's be very clear. Nobody in this body takes human smuggling lightly. But there are many crimes for which we do not impose a 10-year mandatory minimum sentence. 
It was talked about earlier and people didn't know the answer. I'll tell you the answer. The minimum prison term for first degree felony, including murder, is five years. Five years. That's what's on the books now. More importantly, this amendment is not about every single smuggling case. It's about the exceptional cases where a 10-year sentence is contrary to the interest of justice. And I'll close with a short story. A friend of mine from church called me out of the blue. And he said, I need to talk to you about my son. And, and I said, okay, what's going on? He said, well, he's got himself in some real big trouble. He got offered some money to drive some people out of El Paso over into New Mexico. He's an 18-year-old kid, and now he's looking at serious federal consequences for his actions. No criminal history. Comes from a good family, but was short on cash and thought there's not a big deal to it. If you are telling me that that is the same scenario as the nefarious smuggler who is preying on people left and right in our communities, then I don't think you're thinking very hard about this. Justice is not a one-size-fits-all approach. When you do that, you do ensure one result, a failed criminal justice system. I move adoption. The question occurs on the adoption of the amendment. This is a record vote. The clerk will ring the bell. Show Mr. Romero voting aye. Show Mr. Guillen voting nay. They've all voted. There being 63 ayes, 83 nays, the amendment fails. The following amendment, the clerk will read the amendment. Amendment by Ramos. The chair recognizes Ms. Ramos to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members. I bring this amendment to clarify that SB4 includes employers, one of the greatest drivers of immigration who knowingly entice and benefit from undocumented labor. As SB4 is written, it could easily jail a family member innocently driving their extended cousin to church in my neighborhood, which is over 500 miles north of the border. However, on the other hand, this bill will leave unscathed the businesses here in Texas who entice undocumented workers into this country and take advantage of their cheap labor. When you look at the section of the code that we're addressing, smuggling of persons, a smuggler includes an or, an, an smuggler includes one who is encouraging or inducing a person to enter or remain in this country in violation of federal law. We know that that describes many of our employers in Texas. The missing piece of this puzzle in this immigration conversation is the enormous attraction of our labor market. Our demand for undocumented labor drives immigration through the roof. It is wrong for our innocent Texans to be penalized for driving their abuelita to the grocery store, their grandmother, when at the same time these businesses knowingly exploit undocumented labor for inhumane wages and they go unpunished. Let me be clear when I say this, America needs these workers. As we face an unprecedented labor sh shortage, Texas needs more legal immigration. Many of you may or may not know what New York is doing. New York is giving work authorization to TPS individuals from a certain country, Venezuela, so that they, do, they reduce the burden on homeless shelters and these individuals contribute to society while their asylum applications are being processed. It expires within 18 months, and it's only for those individuals that came to Texas, to America, before July 31st, 2023. This is how New York is addressing their problem. In addition to that, they're using their National Guard to help process these applications. That is addressing the labor shortage. That is addressing undocumented immigration. What we're doing here does neither. Instead of giving them 10-year, the immigrants, 10-year mandatory minimums, let's allow them to contribute to our workforce, as many already do, but legally and under the protections of the federal law. 
So many workers across this state and nation are living, li living in the shadows, leaving so many vulnerable to underpaid wages, no recourse when injured on the job, and no labor rights whatsoever. Undocumented workers are what helps keep our state running. They put their lives at daily risk, and every single one of you in this chamber and watching benefits from undocumented labor. The reason that your salad at McDonald's costs $7 and not $17 is because undocumented labor is providing those, those, that workforce that's drastically needed in this state. Every single one of you are benefiting, but they are the ones getting punished and our employers are not. And what I'm saying is in this, in my amendment, what we're saying is that employers need to be held accountable. The reality is what is driving this immigration is supply and demand. Our employers are demanding it, you are demanding it, and these immigrants are supplying it. That is the baseline of what we're talking about. And what I'm saying is we need to hold these employers accountable who are the ones who are driving this, this um, need, this immigration coming into this country. Thank you. The chair recognizes Mr. Guillen in opposition to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, this amendment clarifies that there's no defense to prosecution for businesses but there's currently no defense to prosecution for businesses in the statute or in this bill. And so therefore, this amendment is unnecessary, and so I ask that you vote no on the amendment. The chair recognizes Ms. Ramos to close on the amendment. Thank you, and, and the author of the bill and, and I uh, did have this conversation, and we, once again, if in fact that we are, if he, if the author of the bill is saying in fact we should and we shall go after businesses who are supplying or who are supplying the demand for the undocumented labor, uh, the undocumented labor, then we do need to go after our businesses and hold them accountable. Members, we know the SB4 strategy doesn't work. Let's focus on the root causes of immigration and work on real solutions like holding businesses accountable and vastly expanding legal working status for these families. We also know that in this chamber, nothing is a coincidence. It is not a coincidence that this bill, SB4, was filed on October 9th, three days after Nick Fuentes came to Texas that Friday. That is not a coincidence. Nick Fuentes comes to Texas and this bill is filed three days later. You vote yes on this bill, you vote with Nick Fuentes and against Texas families. Thank you, I move adoption of my amendment. The question occurs on the adoption of the amendment. This is a record vote, the clerk will ring the bell. Have all voted? There being 61 ayes, 84 nays, the amendment fails. Members, that was the last amendment. Anyone wishing to speak on, for, or against the bill, please come down front. The chair recognizes Ms. Niave Criado in opposition to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members. Today, as we deal with this onslaught of immigration-related bills, we find ourselves on the precipice of the complete erosion and destruction of family values that we claim to hold. Do we value separating families? Do we value incarcerating our aunties our tias for taking our nieces to the park? Do we value punishing our cousins for going to school or to church or a shopping mall with their undocumented family members knowingly? Is it the intent of this legislature to convene for the purposes of tearing families apart? Because SB4 is written to do so, SB4 is ill-fitted to address the needs of our state. This legislation extends these penalties and imposes incarceration far beyond its stated purpose. 
SB 4 robs 10 years from the lives of Texans for this offense. And under this legislation, the families would be criminalized and lose a decade of their lives to incarceration as punishment for caring for undocumented aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, or nephews. A decade of their lives driving family members to the grocery store, to the doctor, to the church or school. A decade of our lives for simply living our lives. The heartless consequences of forcing families apart will ripple throughout our state. Our men and women in blue already have to keep us safe with extremely limited resources and extreme levels of responsibility. And instead of solving the problem of smuggling or trafficking, this legislation is going to create more problems for our communities and eviscerates judicial discretion. Parents without children, children without parents, American citizen children without homes, churches without believers, landlords without tenants, small businesses without their workforces. And make no mistake, this bill applies statewide. Make no mistake that this bill applies to American citizens, their children and grandchildren. There's no mandatory minimum for rape. There's no mandatory minimum for murder. And yet, there's a mandatory minimum for being born outside of Texas. Make it make sense. The only way to make it make sense is to vote no on SB4. The chair recognizes Ms. Johnson of Harris in opposition to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I am pretty certain I am the only person that has actually prosecuted this crime. I am certain I am the only person that I've had law enforcement call and say, hey, Ann, you're the new human trafficking prosecutor. Tell me what you could do under this scenario where the feds can't prosecute, but I have a car that just bailed out and everybody took off. I have been in that position. I have filed where state law are, is appropriate against people who have committed crimes. And I will tell you, you have a massive toolbox. If somebody bails out from the car, Rep. Frazier, and I say, did you tell them to stop? And they say, yeah, we told them to stop. Well, that's at least an evading, right? If they bail in the car and they take off, well, now that's a state jail felony evading. And then when we talk about where'd you get the money, were they asking for a pecuniary benefit and we talk about that? Well, then that's smuggling under Section 20.05. And then what about if they're already in a stash house? They're in the stash house and they called the family and they said, I know you guys paid 500 bucks, but we want 500 more. Well, hell, that's kidnapping. And now, Rep. Frazier, do they have a gun? Have they used a gun on you? Well, that, that's aggravated kidnapping. I've been there. I have done this. I have done this in conjunction and connection with the federal government when it is right. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know any prosecutors that ask you to do this. I don't know that there are any of us that are on the front lines in the courtrooms trying to legitimately figure out the layers of the onion. Because when we're talking about organized crime, you're right. There are bad guys. And there are bad guys that will take advantage of kids to act as mules in many circumstances drugs, smuggling, whatever it is. But you give me as a prosecutor a toolbox to say cut the onion and figure out which layer deserves which punishment for their conduct. You're taking away the onion. We've been a slow drip of taking away the onion and my ability with prosecutorial discretion to do what we think is right. And let me tell you where this is going. We know why this is coming up. We know why this is coming up. You know why this is coming up. I promise you, there's a day that's gonna come when you're not gonna be in this building and we will regret that the tail is wagging the dog on setting this policy. So let's talk about burglary of a motor vehicle. Y'all gonna find out if you got a friend that gets their $80,000 car broken into, they're gonna say, wait, that's only a class A? That used to be a third degree used to be two to 10 in prison, and then you got too many people there. You didn't have enough money for prison. You didn't have enough money for beds. And by God, that's a victimless crime. It's not rape or murder. And you had to get those people out. 
So you know what you did? You changed it to a class A. You are pushing this crime just as Chairman Moody and I said. We can see the future because we've lived the past. We did this with drugs. You had to pass 1244A. And I know everybody's glazing over and saying, Ann, I don't have any idea what the hell you're talking about. Well, I do. Because I've been in your criminal court system and I've been in the position of people having to go to prison for conduct that was wrong. And I'm telling you, I am against smuggling. I am for protecting people from crime. I am for protecting people from being used. And I understand that we have to have logical conversations about what's happening on the border. And this doesn't accomplish it. This bill does nothing more than to exacerbate misinformation. And I guarantee you, not only will it cause harm to families, but it will create a policy that one day somebody else is going to have to try to have the political courage to correct because you're setting us up for a prosecutorial fair failure. I don't think you guys had prosecutors come ask you to do this. And so I'm asking you to listen to one. This doesn't accomplish the goal you say you want. So please vote no on this legislation. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Martinez Fisher, for what purpose? Mr. Speaker, I move that the entirety of the debate on SB4, including opening and closing speeches, be reduced to writing, placed in the journal. Members, you've heard the motion. Is there objection? The chair hears none, so ordered. The chair recognizes Mr. Anchia in opposition to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I sat through the uh, the testimony on this bill, and it became crystal clear to me that this bill mi misses the mark substantially on what the proponents of the bill are trying to achieve. I think the the narrative has us thinking about these really nasty criminal gangs in, um, in, in Mexico, cartel members, real frightening bad guys, the kind of guys you might see on Narcos if you, if you follow those series. And, and, and the proponents of this bill are thinking, wow, if we just make the law tougher, it'll deal with the problem. But when we really think about it, that's not the case. Because, yes, there are push factors in places like Cuba, Venezuela, Guatemala that send people here. There's no question. Instability, severe weather, climate change is pushing migration. No question. There are push factors. But what few people really want to admit is that dirty little secret that we have here in Texas, and that is an insatiable appetite for immigrant labor and undocumented immigrant labor that happens in everyone's district in this chamber. And in fact, I was really glad to hear Representative um, Ramos look directly at the language of the smuggling statute, right? Because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about Texas Penal Code 20 spot 05. And if you look at the language very, very clearly in subsection two, it says, if you knowingly encourage or induce a person to enter or remain, remain in this country in violation of federal law, you're a smuggler. How many people in your communities do you know? A rancher, a farmer, a soccer mom? Who knows that the person that they employ is unauthorized, is undocumented. Yeah, yeah, but, but Rafael, we just pay them under the table. We just pay them in cash. Construction worker, the people who painted your home, the people who made your bed at the hotel today, who cooked your meal, was in the back in the kitchen, who washed your dishes. That's the dirty little secret that nobody wants to talk about today is that all of that is smuggling. It's all part of it if you read the statute directly. But nobody from our tough-talking attorney general no, or to any DA in your community is actually ever going to prosecute any of those people who induce a person to remain in this country. Why? Why do you think that is? Because deep down we know 
that immigrants are good for Texas. We know that the Texas miracle is not just low taxes. It's not just our business climate. It really is the fact that we're in the North American continent and we share a border with Mexico that provides willing employers in the United States with willing workers at scale, at scale. And it was really funny because in committee, we had a group that was like farmers and ranchers uh, who were for this bill. And I asked them, when I went through the definition with them, I said, hey, what if we started giving your members mandatory minimums of 10 years? What if we did that, you farmers and ranchers? And they acknowledged, yes, yes, so some of our workers uh, would, uh, would, would qualify as undocumented. Sure, they're unauthorized. Do you use E-Verify? No, 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 we don't. They're the ones who are creating the demand. And it's in every sector. I don't mean to single them out, but when I put it to them, do you want your members serving 10-year mandatory minimums? No, no, then they just want to talk about comprehensive immigration reform. Well, we need to create a safe and legal way to match willing employers and willing workers. And that really is the only way that we get out of this conundrum. Because you can pass this bill and you're just going to, I was reading a, a newspaper article about the people who are the smugglers. They're not the people that you think about from Narcos. They're folks in your community. They're a high school kid. They're a college kid. They're U.S. Marines that were busted for smuggling. They're people who were late on their child support. They're people who needed money to buy diapers. Those are the people that you're going to hit with, with 10-year mandatory minimums. And you will do nothing to deal with the underlying problem. Because any of us who's taken first year college economics knows that if there is a demand, products or services will find their way to market. And that's, that's the dirty little secret that nobody wants to confront in this body and, and, and certainly not in Congress that allows this situation to persist over and over and over again. So can you raise, can you pass this bill and raise, uh, create a mandatory minimum? Yes. Will it be completely ineffective in dealing with the problem? Absolutely. Are you going to hurt a lot of people along the way, Ann Johnson? Oh, heck yes. And we can see the future today. So while you may vote on this, you may feel really good about it, until people are willing to have a serious conversation about what drives our unauthorized immigration. Yes, they're push factors, but it's mainly pull. Because we tell people, hey, if you survive the Darien Gap and you survive getting through Mexico and you cross that border, there are plentiful U.S. jobs waiting for you because we need immigrants. We need immigrants in the United States. And we also need a safe and legal way for these immigrants not to be exploited and not to be smuggled and for people not to get caught up in the web of this bill. But if we just keep doing what we're doing now, onesies and twosies, little bills like this, we're going to be back here again and there will be another failed tactic to try to deal with the problem. And instead, I think it would be far more productive for us to talk about that dirty little secret, surface that part of the Texas miracle, and that is our immigrant population that breathes life into and is the oxygen for not only our communities, but for our economy in this state. So members, I urge you vote no, and instead lend your collective voices to urging Congress to fixing the problem. Thank you. The chair recognizes Mr. Guillen to close on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, this bill will deter smuggling by throwing the book at those that commit the crime. It's bipartisan, as it's joint authored by members of both parties in both houses, including Senator Cesar Blanco and Representative Morales here in the House. It passed the Senate 29 to 2. This exact bill passed the Senate 29 to 2. I urge you to vote aye. Move passage. The question occur occurs on passage to third reading of SB4. This is a record vote. The clerk will ring the bell. Show Ms. Niave Criado voting nay. 
Show Mr. Kane voting aye. Have all voted? Have all voted. There being 90 ayes, 57 nays, SB4 has passed the third reading.